Well, good afternoon. I realize it's Friday afternoon, so you all are quite eager for this to be a brief presentation. And I wanted to begin with an apology that uh, typically the wrap-up talk at, a, at the end of a year in which ethics has been infused across the curriculum uh, at, the, at the, the last symposium of a series, that the concluding talk is one that wraps it all up, ties up the loose ends, connects the dots, uh, brings it all into context uh, so that uh, you can digest and have a comprehensible whole of what's come of uh, this year-long exercise and this symposium in particular. And it's been just fascinating to hear the, the talks that we've heard today. Uh, but this is not that talk. This is the other talk. Uh, it's one in which uh, we just turn it all upside down. It's not even thinking outside the box. It's questioning whether we were considering even the right boxes at all. Uh, it's uh, not about hoping that you will get the right answers, uh, but questioning, sort of challenging you to think about what are the right questions. And uh, there's nothing particularly practical or operational about the talk I give today, because I'm looking over the horizon uh, at, at a very different type of world. I'm a technologist, and so we're going to set the table by talking about emerging technologies. Uh, but, <coughs> excuse me, but we're going to uh, really pose some deep ethical questions uh, that are quite different than, than what you get with the myopia of our day-to-day -day challenges. Uh, it's, uh, in some sense, attuned to that adage of life is, life is what happens to you while you're planning to do something else. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's really the, the coming conflict, uh, to call it a world war is really a misnomer, but the coming conflict is what happens to you while you're planning to do another type of war. Uh, and in order to address that, we've got to go through a, a, a quick overview of some of these emerging technologies. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't really get interesting till toward the end, but it's a climb that's, that's worth it once we get to that vantage point. <coughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about what may be happening in the next 40 or 50 years in terms of these emerging technologies. And as I said, it's a misnomer to think of it as World War III, but it is a, a very different kind of coming competition that we will find ourselves in. So to put it in context, uh, a brief history of history, the universe we're in, it's about 15 perhaps 20 billion years old, uh, that the solar system we're in is about four and a half billion years old, uh, that life first appeared on Earth about 3.2 billion years ago, that multicellular life appeared about 800 million years ago, that differentiated brain function appeared within the, the animal world about 200 million years ago, that dinosaurs ruled the Earth till about 65 million years ago. And our first ancestors, the Homo erectus, stood up and started the beginning of our migration out of Africa about four, perhaps five million years ago. Not on this time scale, not very long ago. <coughs> uh, that uh, our, our direct ancestors, Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, only about 125, maybe 150,000 years old when our brain size doubled and we developed the voice box. So we uh, began to have meaningful speech. And with, with languages, with speech, we were able to begin to actually store up and transfer to, to succeeding generations much more of our intellectual DNA, not our biological, but our learned lessons. And then the biggest event recently was just 13,000 years ago, the end of the last ice age, when our true colonization uh, really took root around the, the world. And everything that we think of as human history, I think I've got a slide on this, but basically everything that we talk about is our civilization of human history has transpired just in these last 13,000 years. I mean, barely a blink of the eye on the, on the scale of, of uh, even, even life on Earth. Uh, it's this transition to the, uh, it took about a thousand years after the end of the last ice age, but we transitioned to an agrarian society. 
moving away from hunter-gatherers, and it was the surpluses of the agrarian society that allowed us to have specialties, which included businessmen, politicians, doctors, educators, soldiers, <coughs> all of the things that really led to what we think of as our civilization today. Uh, and everything that passes for human history has played out in these last 13,000 years or so against a fairly restrictive landscape of, of boundaries and barriers to trade, commerce, competition, uh, and, and conquest. There was another event, if, if we're talking ethics, it's worth noting, <coughs> in the West to the Enlightenment only a few hundred years ago. Uh, the development of the age of reason, the sense that that nature existed and could be learned and was exploitable, controllable. And as we began to, to move away from the idea that there were these uh, impetuous gods that caused the sun to rise and fall because they rode flaming chariots across the sky, that we began to, to realize that, that nature had its own set of rules, that we could learn them, and that we could use them to do things. And it's in the use of those rules, the technologies that came out of that, that's where ethics really hits the, uh, the, the, the crux of what I'm trying to talk about today. The responsible ethical use of our knowledge about how nature works. <coughs> and all of that has really taken root just in the last couple of hundred years. Uh, it wasn't an immediate success. The Industrial Revolution that uh, was the aftermath of the Enlightenment uh, and the Age of Reason, uh, fueled in part by the printing press, and the printing press is a great example I'll mention in just a moment, uh, but it, it disseminated knowledge from the ruling elite to the next class, not to everyone, but to those who could read, the literate class. But the, the peasant class, those that worked in the factories, were still viewed in this, I love this pseudo-speciation idea, that they were still viewed almost like interchangeable cogs in a, in a machine. And, and it was the, so the technology that came out of this period was very dehumanizing. And it caused a backlash in education uh, and in our sense of how we apply knowledge. <coughs> Oops. Uh, it shows up in literature. It's when there, there was a number of literary uh, masterpieces that talked about our own technology rising up to destroy us. Uh, and, and so it was the cautionary tale of the ethical use of these technologies that we now were beginning to have available to us. <coughs> so if I look at the lessons of history with regard to technology, there's a few things <coughs> that whether we like it or not, uh, I think are abs absolutely guaranteed. I'll get that, Jamie, it's okay. Actually, hand me the Diet Coke down there. I'm a, an addict. Uh, Thanks. Uh, technology accumulates. It doesn't really, it's catalytic. It doesn't really destroy itself in building. It, it actually converges. Uh, that it's uh, an imperative. Some, whether there's, there's moral uncertainty about whether we want something to happen or not, if there's a competitive advantage and the scientific capability, history shows it does happen. There's only been a couple of examples in history in which technology has even been momentarily suppressed within different, different cultures. Uh, the Japanese suppressed the introduction of firearms, suppressed it for about 150 years because it found itself in conflict with their samurai culture. Now, uh, despite what the movies may show, a peasant with a gun was more than match for a samurai, which is why it was, that was so resisted. But it didn't stop the introduction of firearms around the world and their evolution, and, and it didn't suppress it for very long. The other case, uh, which is much more interesting because its fingerprints are still in the world today, is that about 600 years ago, a little less than 600 years, the Chinese uh, were the world's greatest maritime trading fleet. They traded throughout the Indian and Pacific Oceans, some evidence they may have been into the Atlantic, uh, but uh, the religious uh, after the emperor died and a child emperor came into power, the religious prefects really didn't like the world that was being encountered outside their range of influence. And so uh, in the 1420s, uh, the, the entire fleet was burned in harbor and all of their records were erased. We know about them because uh, every place that they traded with still had records of their presence. Uh, but the Chinese are just beginning to come out of that, that very, very xenophobic in 
isolationist view. And it's important that we understand that because that, that actually has uh, a lot to say about their worldview even today as, as they're moving beyond uh, that attempt to suppress a technology. Final thing though, <coughs> well, final two things. One, technology is decisive. Uh, that when two, two civilizations that are technologically very different come into contact, the less technologically proficient uh, civilization is either assimilated or exterminated. There's really been no historical examples of just wonderful, peaceful coexistence. Uh, and then it's exponential, which is something I'm going to talk about a bit. <coughs> it's sometimes hard to understand the exponential of technology because we see the world up so close. Uh, we have this, what's called a linear intuitive, a myopia that within our own personal life experience, it, it is human nature to connect the dots in a straight line. And yet that's not, when you step back, that's not the way that you see a lot of technologies progressing. And I like to use the example of a fishbowl. There's a party uh, puzzle. Uh, if you had a fishbowl in which there was one marble, and then a minute later, there was a second marble, and then two minutes later, that would double again to four, and, a, and two minutes after that to eight, and within an hour, the fishbowl was filled. When would the fishbowl only be half full? At the 59th minute, it had one more doubling. And in fact, if you were standing back and watching the fishbowl during this hour, you would say for most of the time, nothing's happening. I don't actually see anything happening. And then in the last few minutes, it would look like an explosion of things happening. Even though it was on an exponential the entire time. Well, technology in lots of areas is on that exponential. Sometimes we can see the explosion because it's happened within, within our life experience. In other cases, it's still bubbling along and we know the exponential where it's headed, even though uh, we haven't quite reached the point where we can see that fishbowl really filling up quickly yet. All through history, people have said, well, it just can't continue. Uh, for, for several thousand years, we've looked at technology and said, uh, it's been wonderful up until now, but we've got it all. There was a proposal in Congress to pl close the patent office and the Lincoln administration. Everything had been invented. Uh, it's just, uh, Bill Gates said, we'll never need more than about 125K memory in a computer. Thomas J. Watson, who founded the IBM labs, said the world needs five, maybe six computers. I mean, we're always coming short when we look at the effects of these technologies. Uh, there's four stages of technology that generally are talked about. One is simply responsive, that is the, the old adage that necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, then we often find other applications of those inventions. They become adaptive. Then they become disruptive, that we think of really whole new ways that we can do things. That is, in those cases, that it's the invention that becomes the mother of our necessity. And then for a very few, they become truly transformative to our society and the way that we lead our lives. So a few examples. Uh, <coughs> uh, the, the, I'm a radio physicist, so you've got to put up with my examples coming from that mostly. But Rutherford B. Hayes, first long distance phone call. Fascinating from Alexander Graham Bell. Fa fascinating little device, who would ever want to use one for the telephone? The printing press, a perfect example. <clears throat> Usually when a disruptive technology is first introduced, it's trying to do something that was done actually better, a less efficient way. If you think of the, the very first printed books, they were made to look like they were handwritten. Wonderful, beautiful script, colored and everything. It's only when you got away from that that you realized that you didn't have to do that. And now today the printing press is replaced by the, uh, except for those of us who are just tactile, very addicted, uh, it's being replaced by digital forms of, of printing. It, uh, but, it, but it caused the dissemination of knowledge to ever broader portions of the population. Telephone, another great example. <coughs> Radio, uh, often these technologies, they come out, they're, they're bad business investments. Uh, the, the quote from the San Francisco Telegraph, uh, the San Francisco Observer, uh, about the telegraph, never have so many lost so much money so quickly on an idea of, of in, so inherently little value, talking about the Marconi company. Uh, 
Even visionaries, H.G. Wells in 1925 said, radio's really run its course, the wireless world is over. Uh, it's, it's going to completely disappear soon. Uh, this is one for, if you've had kids in the last few decades, I, I like it. In the 1939 New York World's Fair, when the television was introduced, the review of it, nice little invention, but it'll never catch on because the average American family simply has no time for it. <laughs> it became a disruptive technology. It changed the way society works. And we have a number, not quite, dis not quite transformative, but certainly disruptive. Today we have a transformative technology upon us, the internet. Uh, it is fundamentally changing the way that we communicate, the way that we stay connected. Uh, we can begin to see, uh, with, with, some, with some trepidation, we can begin to say that we're beginning to see the end of nation state boundaries, that we're beginning to, to work across those boundaries in ways that uh, really have no geographic restrictions. A, a young Chinese teenager with an iPhone has more in common with a young American teenager than either of them have with their parents. Uh, that they're growing up in a very different world and it's changing the connectivity. They may not be great buddy friends. They may not, as we heard earlier, smell and, and exchange pheromones, although that might be coming. But, uh, but, but they are a different class. They're, in fact, neuroscience has shown their brains are even wired differently because of this access to a different kind of technology. <coughs> Not every idea is a great one. Uh, <laughs> and this comes from, I'm sure this was a volunteer from one of the military services. But, uh, so before we talk about some of the, the possibilities of technology and the ethical challenges that come from that, I thought it's important to discuss some of the, the, down, the dark side. Uh, do we have a future? We've, many in this room have grown up in a time in which we, we were faced with the possibility of nuclear extermination. We've been on the nuclear threshold uh, for so long that, that the rising generation of many of you all have nuclear amnesia. You don't remember that uh, we, were, we were faced with what we thought was a, a credible threat to the extinction of our species. <clears throat> and when I show my classes the old 1950s and early 60s civil defense films, the duck and cover types of films, they think it's a Saturday Night Live skit. I mean, it is that far removed from their sense of what the world could have been like. But the, but the technologies that give us some amazing possibilities also give us the, the, the technological capability of, of extinguishing ourselves. And nuclear is just the, the first, but not the only example. There's all, all sorts of range of weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> the one which disturbs me the most right now is biological. It's possible today to genetically engineer biotoxins for which there is no inbred immunity within the human population. <clears throat> and if the prospect of killing everyone bothers you, you can also genetically engineer those to have cellular receptor sites tied to specific uh, DNA traits, genetic traits. So the idea of ethnic cleansing could take on a whole new meaning using genetically engineered biotoxins. Um, and, and, and it doesn't take large uranium enrichment plants or other things, basement laboratories have this capability. <coughs> not quite yet, but not very far away. We've talked a lot, a lot recently about our vulnerability in cyberspace and the, the weapons of mass disruption to, to at least society as we know it. Lots of interest in new forms of advanced technology for war fighting, robotics, autonomous systems, space operations, electronic warfare, and so forth. And then the, new, the empowerment that technology gives to, to either the, the, the small uh, rogue states like in North Korea or to even non-state actors uh, of which there's a rising number that may have access to, to uh, very lethal technologies. And even if we didn't do it on purpose, uh, we've, we've been known to have uh, some, some fairly serious little accidents. Uh, Having been at Los Alamos for 10 years, I assure you we do a lot to make sure that the bombs don't detonate when, when you drop them. 
Uh, but anything that humans have designed will ultimately find a way to fail. Uh, we're just, uh, it's part of our DNA. So the conclusion I come from this is that simply that the world is no longer safe for conflict. We can't look at military solutions uh, at the global scale for, our, uh, for resolving this because the technologies are soon rising uh, that, that will enable even small actors to have devastating consequences uh, for, for large numbers of the Earth's population. Um, that puts a great deal of pressure then on the political process and, and all of the sanctions and so forth. But <coughs> the ethics for the military, uh, I think, become particularly acute when we realize that we're dealing with technologies that can have very leveraged consequences. And it's no longer uh, the, the, the normal dynamic that we've gotten used to. <coughs> so. Uh, I would argue that because of the connectivity of the world, that the whole sense of war fighting within the next 30 or 40 years will fundamentally change. Uh, and in terms of, it, of, of how it will change, we're, we're, we're not just looking at how we fight and where we fight, uh, but fundamental questions of, of who we're fighting, uh, and, and even at some point, as I'll get to in just a moment, the questions of why we fight. Uh, because the actual adversary may not be whom we think. I'm going to talk about three technologies just briefly to get us to a vantage point that, that uh, I think is worth the climb. <coughs> Nanotechnologies, that's both micro-manufacturing and uh, new kinds of materials, the biotechnologies, and then uh, computing robotics, information technologies. <coughs> Excuse me. In materials, Materials seem like a pretty dull topic for trying to, to, to look at the future. But if you think about it, we've used materials to classify our societies for human history, from the Stone Age on up. We've, we've talked about the importance of clay, the, the pots and the tablets for writing and so forth, whereas the, the, the substrate engine for the agrarian societies that, that were successful. Uh, the, the extraction of metals, beginning with copper, and then learning how to alloy that with tin to make bronze, the Iron Age, the Steel Age, the Silicon Age, and so forth, plastics, composites. <coughs> What's interesting is that the dominant material, uh, you can see the exponential in this, the dominant material st stays dominant for a shorter and shorter period of time. Uh, today, for the first time in human history, we're no longer bound to using materials that we find in nature. Everything that we've used thus far is stuff we find in nature. Sometimes we heat it up, mix it together, cool it down, and see what we've got. But it's some stuff that, that is naturally provided. For the first time in human history today, we can build materials one molecule at a time. We know how to use very sophisticated techniques, and it's been estimated that there's more than a hundredfold materials available to us today than we've ever had before. With properties that are insulators, conductors, semiconductors, luminescent, uh, stronger than diamonds, thinner than spider webs, a, a whole range of, of possibilities. Uh, just waiting for, for bright minds to come along, figure out what they can do, and then what to do with it, the applied side of that. Nanotechnology gets a lot of press. We're seeing it beginning to show up in materials. Uh, it will fundamentally change electronics. Uh, the ability to manufacture at smaller and smaller scales is fascinating. Uh, here's powers of 10, an old slide, but showing starting with a human hand and then magnifying it down and down. The one, the one that I think is fascinating, if, whoops. Where's the pointer on this? Well, that, Slide five, the white blood cell. If you look at that si slide, uh, <coughs> in the next one, we actually build devices that, that are working devices that fit easily inside of that. We're now able to build little machines, some of them movable, robotics, uh, even slightly programmable, although control is a little bit of an issue. But we can build machines that are smaller than the machines that nature evolved to take care of our our bodies, the housekeepers of the future human body, may well be these little nanobots, these, these small machines that we know how to manufacture today. And we can build them smaller by a factor of two 
about every 12 months. So we're getting, that's the exponential that they seem to be on. And at some point, the science fiction of shrinking down into housekeepers that we actually manufacture, uh, we're, we're very close to the point today that uh, uh, you sh in 2011, we developed the first pills that you could take that actually had little nanobots that would do some functions inside the human body. <coughs> and there's, they actually exist. We, uh, we have manufactured some and used them inside of humans. Of course, not all of us are comfortable with the idea of little nanobots running around inside of us, so it's not particularly attractive yet, uh, but it's coming. Also, if you just think about biotechnology, biotechnology is just a biological form of nanobots. They're just little robots. They're, they're bio biological molecules. <coughs> they run on a computer code called our genetic code. Uh, but they perform functions. The operating sy system is the genome. And uh, they've been given basically one uh, operating task, which is to reproduce. Uh, and that's who we are. And everything that we've, that's built up in our biology has come out of that sort of simple operating system and task. <clears throat> so if you look at the computer code, we're not really as complicated as we would hope. I mean, 25,000 plus or minus a few thousand genes in the, in the genome. The human brain, only about 3,000 genes seem to make it up. Uh, the, the human genome is a complicated computer program. It's about three to four trillion words long. Really big. But finite. And we've decoded it. And, we're, and within another decade or so, every one of us will have our own genome decoded. It's a, I mean, it's a many, many billion word computer code, but it's written in an alphabet of only four letters that co combine together to form only about a dozen amino acids that string together to form families of proteins. It's just, it's a, it's a large but finite engineering problem that is almost solved. We've learned how to read the genetic code we're now beginning to learn how to write the genetic code. The first thing a computer programmer does, as most of you are aware, when you write code, is you debug it. You take the flaws out. We're learning how to debug the human genetic code. <clears throat> of course, there's a little bit of a debate who gets to decide what a bug is or not. What's fascinating is we're moving beyond even just writing this code to something called synthetic biology. We're also creating our own letters. So we're not restricted to the four that nature gave us even. We've begun to create synthetic biologies uh, with our own alphabets. Uh, and the, the possibilities are endless once you start doing that. <coughs> As I said, we're not very complicated. Uh, it's, my kids get a kick out of the fact that we're almost half worm. Uh, that, that we're a Rube Goldberg machine built out of stuff that has evolved over the last several million years, and for humans, really just the last few million years. <clears throat> and uh, the differences among us as human beings are much smaller uh, than, than we often, um, within, our, within our sense of the world, attribute. It's possible... Uh, we've talked about ge genetic codes, uh, being able to end disease. We can, we can genetically code bacteria and viruses. We can actually write our own code. Uh, it's not inconceivable that all of the work that's going into to disease prevention and treatment today will be a solved problem within another 30 or 40 years. <coughs> We're already at work within the military of, of the technology it takes to regrow uh, injured or missing limbs. I mean, we, we can actually do that in some cases today. Uh, and we're, we're now talking about not just debugging the computer code, but improving on it. Uh, all sorts of ethical questions that come about when, when you start being able to go into uh, your genetic code or your, your children's genetic codes and checking boxes in terms of skill sets or IQ or other things that you would like to improve. <coughs> Our understanding of all this, it's been pointed out, is limited only by the finiteness of our lifespan. That we're, it's beginning to take us a significant part of our lives to learn all this uh, and, 
and so we don't have much time left to do something with it. <laughs> so the questions come up, why do we die? Why do we get old and die? That is a solution to a problem that, that evolution came up with, that we don't, a problem that we don't have anymore. We needed to be able to have cellular senescence so that there could be succeeding generations that could mutate and adapt to changing environmental conditions uh, in order to ensure the diversity that would ensure the survival of our species. But today we, we shape the environment to meet our needs, not the other way around. And that there's less uh, and maybe no environmental reason at the moment for us to have to have this this constant cycle of cellular senescence and renewal. <coughs> so could you live forever? Turns out the answer is yes. We know why the cells age and die. It's, it's actually a clever but, but not very complicated technique. There's something called telomeres. They're little enzyme caps. The analogy is often used that they're like the hard caps on the ends of shoelaces. And when the chromosome divides, the hard cap erodes away a little bit, and after 50 to 100 cell divisions, the cap is gone and the shoelace unravels and, and that chromosome dies. It's, it's a, a fuse, a time fuse, built into us by nature to ensure that we go through this aging process. But we've learned how to stop that from happening. We know how to stop the telomere from eroding away and even how to restore it back to full strength. We can build cells, we have built cells, that are essentially immortal. In fact, nature did that before us. They're, it's called cancer. Uh, but, but in fact, we're made up of about a uh, hundred trillion different cells, the average person, but only 300 different kinds of cells. And we're learning how to stop each of those cells from getting old. It's, it's completely conceivable that our children the, the young people in college today even, may never experience biological death, that this will be a solved problem within the next 50 years. Now, you could still die from violence or accident, and, and if that were the case today, the only way that you could die, your life expectancy would be about 650 years. Um, and I've asked students, does that mean that you would drive cars with really big bumpers and really low speed limits? And, that's not built into our DNA at the moment. They said, of course not. But it would have, of course, also be a procrastinator's nightmare. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or dream, yeah. Uh, so we're learning, we're, we're learning what it means to, to biologically have cells that have, have whole organisms that are essentially immortal. But what's the ethics of living forever? I mean, all sorts of societal changes come. The Earth can't keep supporting new and more and more generations of people. Uh, I ask my students, how many of you would uh, willingly b believe that it is such a fundamental human value to have a family that you would willingly give up your life at some point in the future, even though you biologically did not have to, in order to have your own family? About half the students will say that. Then I say that's not really the, that's the softball question. The way generations work, how many of you believe it's such a fundamental right to have your own family that you'd give up your parents? Now there's always one who raises their hand. <laughs> and, and, and if this timetable is wrong, it's not wrong by a lot. It might not be your children, it might be your grandchildren. Uh, but this is, a, this is technologically a problem that we're well along the way to say, solving. It's showing up in the scientific literature and if, even in the popular literature now, openly talking about immortality research. <coughs> uh, and then we move on to computing. Uh, this is a curve that shows something called Moore's Law. Uh, this year is the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law. Gordon Moore uh, worked at the time at Fairchild Electronics, later co-founded Intel, the computer chip company. And he was asked to make a prediction 50 years ago for what he saw in terms of computer chips for the next decade. <laughs> and he made an observation that it seemed as if, to put it simplistically, that, that uh, the price fell by a factor of two and the, and the computing efficiency went up by a factor of two in computer chips about every 18 months. About every 18 months. That was the exponential curve. <laughs> and that shows up here on a semi-log plot. Um, there was a little break 
If you go back even further, a little break in the 40s when we went from vacuum tubes to transistors. <coughs> and in fact, after we went to transistors, the curve picked up speed a bit. So it's now about a 12-month doubling time. This has happened within our lifetime. This has happened within our lifetime, and yet we don't really notice how astounding this is. To, to use an example that, you know, with different math was included in an article about, in the New York Times about the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law. If you bought a car 50 years ago, if you bought a car in 1965, <coughs> and you assigned Moore's Law's type of growth to its efficiency, cost, and, and operating speed, then that car today, that car today would get 20 million miles per gallon. It would have a top speed of 2.4 million miles per hour. And the best part, the cost of that car, one half cent. That's what's happened within our lifetime in computing. Now, we, it's just astounding that that's happened, and it continues to go. We stay on Moore's Law, and it will continue for at least the foreseeable future. Uh, this is happening kind of below the surface of what most of us notice, uh, but just a phenomenal change happening within the technology world because of these exponentials. And in computing, we're beginning to develop machines that rival, actually, now human intelligence. <coughs> and uh, right now, the, the really smart machines are big supercomputers. It was the Watson that won that crushed people at Jeopardy now a year or two ago. Uh, in, the, in the late 90s, there was a, a computer that played Garry Kasparov, the, the world chess champion. The first time they played, Garry Kasparov won, and people, pundits said, computers will never be able to actually analyze the, the aesthetic value of different positions, but they just programmed that in. The next year, the computer crushed Garry Kasparov and absolutely just annihilated him. Uh, machines are beginning to, to develop artificial intelligence. I've, I uh, co-hosted a neuroscience symposium <coughs> uh, in London about 12 years ago. And all of the neuro top neuroscientists from around the world, and they all complain their very top students were all getting hired by computer programming companies. <coughs> because these artificially intelligent machines are using the same neural network pattern that the human brain uses and improving on it in some areas. So these are machines that think like you and I do. <coughs> uh, one of the father figures uh, in predicting in this field, <coughs> uh, Ray Kurzweil, uh, talks about the singularity, the moment in which artificial intelligent machines surpass human intelligence. Uh, in his predictions by the year 2020, not very long, far away, we'll have machines that can pass the Turing test. Alan Turing, a famous computer scientist in the 50s and 60s who posed a challenge that in blind interrogation, so that you cannot see who's answering your questions, that a computer be indistinguishable from a human. And they actually have that competition every year. <coughs> There's a really good book uh, I found it enjoyable that it's been published a couple years ago now, called The Most Human Human, because they run that camp competition until there's just one person left. And so the one person left they consider to be the most human of the humans. <coughs> but machines will pass the Turing test very soon. Uh, they're on this exponential curve. The problem is that once they become able to pass the Turing test, they don't stop. They double in capacity every 12 to 18 months. By 2030, Kurzweil predicts that we'll be exporting a lot of our routine thinking to computers embedded in the world around us. <coughs> Most of us could use that right now. I mean, remembering phone numbers, uh, interfacing with the internet, uh, it's where we keep our, all of our photographs and other things, all of that to be just embedded around us. And that the human brain will be more like a central processor. But Kurzweil says, yeah, but the computers keep getting better, faster. By 2040, actually, we'll have exported most of the central processing to the computer world. And the human brain will be more like a peripheral device. 
There's a few things that we do pretty well. Pattern recognition. Uh, we do a pretty good job of, of decision support when there's limited, faulty information. We need a quick decision. It may not be the most optimal, but it's a pretty good one. Sort of the fight, flight, or freeze issue that was brought up earlier. So the human brain has some things that it's fairly good at. <coughs> but Kurzweil predicts by 2050, everything will be exported. That, that human intelligence, that whatever it means to be human, will be completely transportable over into the machine world. Machines thinking the same way we do in some cases, more efficiently in others, <coughs> and that the biological brain will be obsolete. I'm not really comfortable with that, but actually that's, there's, there's, there's plenty of evidence to su suggest that we're already on that curve. We're already on that curve. And we don't want to get into competition. <coughs> uh, we're moving into a world in which there's sort of wireless tele-everything. Uh, when you talk about war fighting, this is certainly true. It's come up several times today and many times, but there's a problem. Evolution didn't anticipate that. It was pointed out in a conversation I had a couple days ago that the, that the computer on your desktop doesn't look that different from the computer that was on your desktop 50 years ago. Screen, keyboard, there was no mouse, but uh, the reason for that is not limitations in the computer. It's because of limitations in us, that we're the kink and the bandwidth. We only run at, a, our brain only runs at about eight hertz. Eight hertz, that's why we don't see the lights flashing on and off every 60 times a second. I mean, our brain is really not a fast machine. Uh, so let me back, talk about this a little bit more. <coughs> We don't want to get into competition. We don't want to get into competition. Uh, we'll lose. The human, the human brain is slow, requires chemical energy, requires oxygen, has eight hours of maintenance downtime out of every 24, unless you're a student. And, um, we're really not competitive in that world. And all of the things that, that really are weaknesses in that system are tied to to, to our failures, not, not limitations of the machine. <coughs> uh, if you look at Wall Street today, uh, a couple of years ago the number was 84% of all trades on Wall Street are done by computers, high frequency computers, uh, that, that you have to be that fast. And then there, there's an article that came out relatively recently talking about uh, are these computer systems that that cause some of the flash crashes and so forth, are they, are they now too fast to fail? If you think about technology and its place in war fighting, we are the slowest part of the decision tree when it comes to war fighting decisions. So how do you feel about the ethics of a machine that takes, that's not just our extended tool, but in a world in which speed can make the difference between success and failure of turning over the decision tree to a machine. And what does a flash crash on Wall Street, what's the comparable exercise in the, in the military world when a computer makes a mistake in that few milliseconds of decision making that it has? Or if, do we want to keep humans in the loop? And if we keep humans in the loop, then we become vulnerable to being the, the we're moving from a world in which the big eat the small to a world in which the fast eat the slow. And in and, uh, and the war fighting world, that causes a really ethical question about how engaged we allow the machines to be in, in decision making. Uh, so, so as I said, evolution never designed us for the interface that we need to work with this, with this transformative technological world. If we don't find a way of, of working, of, of, of having a, a good relationship with this te technical world that's coming, we will either, as history has shown, either be assimilated or exterminated. As I vote for assimilation. Uh, what we don't get to vote is say, no, we just don't want it. It's coming. We're already there. Uh, we already have lots of mechanical adjuncts. We wear glasses, we have watches, some have pacemakers, artificial knees. I asked my students, someone with an artificial hip, are they only 98% human? 
Well, well, no. What we think of as being human really isn't tied necessarily to the biological structure that surrounds us. Um, so it, we're actually getting to a place where the boundaries between these machines and humans are likely, I think, to disappear. Uh, people joke with different names like Robo sapiens, but we actually are at one of these speciation moments, practically. I've, I've seen our, the whole essence of, of what it means to be human transform into to something else. <coughs> We're seeing the convergence of these three revolutions in technology that I mentioned before. Uh, one of the examples, I just pulled this out of the literature, uh, artificial eyes, retinas, ways of actually augmented reality. Uh, and that shows up in war fighting and lots of interesting examples today. Uh, in the future, we're already doing this in laboratories, uh, direct neurorobotics, direct interfaces between our biological brain and the outside world. The, the research right now is motivated by uh, helping those with brain stem injuries. But in the very near future, their advantage over us will be so great that we'll all want that. And I ask students, suppose, at least in the beginning, because of neuroplasticity, that your best advantage is done if you install one of these neurorobotic connectors, transducers, when you're very young, before your brain has actually quite developed the super highway of networking. Would you put one of these in your children, in your child? And usually the, the, the audience, the, the room of students will say, no, I, you know, I'll wait. But there's always one or two who will say, well, sure. And then we start talking about, well, your kid's going to be in the same classroom with that kid who has access to, to the full internet and the multiplication tables are you know, not something you have to memorize. Uh, the advantages are so great that by the end of the conversation, usually 90% of the, of the students in the class say, I don't like it, but yes, I would have to let my child have that same advantage. And these transducers already exist. As I said, we're, we're doing this, this work already. We know that the human brain right now is the, the machine that does the, the interface. Uh, we provide electrical signals, and it figures out what to do with them. But, but we're understanding how that works. <coughs> and it's not science fiction. These are occurring across the scientific literature today. Uh, it's, it's in the laboratories at this moment. Here, here's the artificial eye I mentioned. This is actually a couple years old. A, an artificial retina, look at a hand. You can tell it's a hand, still not great, except that that's getting better every 12 months. That's doubling in resolution every 12 months. And within about 10 years or less, the artificial retina will be far better than the human eye. And it's not restricted to just visible light. You can do infrared, ultraviolet. Uh, you can do the same thing in audio. In fact, all of our sensory inputs you can extend with these, these electromechanical devices. <coughs> and so the future warfighter may be a, a very different looking human, uh, not constrained by the limitations of our own evolutionarily developed biologies. Even the sense of reality is changing, uh, which is, is, is getting really far out there. Uh, that <coughs> it's possible now to go into virtual worlds. Everyone has seen kids that get virtually addicted. That, that wasn't meant to be a pun. That get uh, uh, addicted to virtual worlds. Uh, the the warfighting games are very popular. The, but any of the gaming is, has tapped into the, to the reward structure of our own biology. <coughs> if you were to take the human brain right now, you're, you're processing about 18, 10 to the 18 bits per second of information coming into the brain through, through your sensory inputs right now. If you were to add a million people that you might interact with within a finite lifetime, that would add another 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 10th bits per second of processing requirement. If you throw in the environment and all of its randomness, another 10 to the 16 bits per second or so, with roughly 10 to the 40 to 10 to the 44 bits per second of processing power, 
you could create a virtual reality that was indistinguishable from what your brain's processing right now. We're nowhere close to that capability. Nowhere close, except if you take Moore's law and start projecting it out. And we'll get there in another 30, 40 years. We'll be able to actually have virtual worlds that, that are indistinguishable from the world we're in today, except that you get to make up the rules. You're not, and you get to have a reset button. In fact, if you go into that world, there gets to be more than one of you. You can have copies of yourself. I mean, it's just uh, nothing in our evolution has prepared us for what I think is the addictive attraction of that type of world. And it becomes the anarchist dream. You can have your own universe and never have to interact with anyone. Or if you look at the, the way gaming has worked, you can actually then interact with lots of people on lots of different levels. Uh, and it, it becomes a mechanism for, for actual, a different kind of community. So uh, in, in that virtual reality, it's not just, as I used the analogy before, it's not, it's not just thinking outside the box. It's recognizing that the boxes that we normally think of aren't really there. And that the future of, of this robo-sapiens may be the, the, these types of cyborgs that have been hypothesized in science fiction, except that they don't actually have to look like us. Uh, that's just done, I think, for our own uh, immediate comfort. <clears throat> and it's not necessarily, it makes me really uncomfortable because I'm an old timer, but it may not be that this is something really perverse. It may be that simply any intelligent civilization reaches a point where it takes control of its own evolution. And that this is just actually what nature intended. Uh, that, that, that at this point in, in the development of intelligence, we reach this transcendent moment when we can move beyond our own biology. <coughs> this is, uh, actually comes from Ray Kurzweil has a Singularity University to talk about this. People, though, have issued, uh, a, a number of folks have issued dire warnings that once a computer gets to the point that it's sentient, that it thinks for itself, it has its own consciousness, and that it's smarter than us, and it's doubling in capacity very rapidly, it may decide it doesn't need us. Uh, that, that, that in fact, once we create these kinds of sentient artificial intelligences, and they stay on Moore's Law beyond where we are, because we don't, we don't double in capacity every 12 to 18 months, uh, that we become obsolete, uh, and that ultimately uh, there will be no need to keep us around. I don't know that that's true or not true, but certainly as an ethical question, it probably is worth thinking about. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke uh, talked about how once these machines become sentient, if you develop warfighting autonomous systems that have a sentient sense of self, are they not entitled to the same human rights that we attach to biological humans? Uh, we don't think as much about sacrificing a machine, uh, but I don't know. So uh, the future conflict, the, this World War III that, as I say, is a misnomer, one of the things that I worry about is that it's not that it's coming, that it's already begun. And we haven't noticed. Nobody's told us about it yet. In fact, to, to, to use an extension of the discussion this morning, if, if, if the end of war is when you uh, have convinced your enemy uh, to give up, that they lose the will to resist, how many of us are resisting? Uh, how many of us are in there fighting the ethics of technology, uh, or have we surrendered? Have we already begun to surrender? Because it's just so hard. I mean, it's, we still have our kids program the VCR. Uh, that the tech, it, it's no longer a case that technology is our tool. Increasingly, if you look at how people spend their lives, that, that we are the tool of these technologies. So this, this war, if, this, this competition, is in many ways already underway. It's already underway, and we have to, we have to think of what our appropriate place in it is. And uh, to, sh to show that it's, that it's relevant and timely, this is this week's Economist. 
And two things in it that bothered me. One, the big headline, Artificial Intelligence Promise or Peril, which is this issue of once artificially intelligent machines pass us, then, then we become increasingly uh, obsolete. The little headline up at top, Special Report on Financial Technology. That's just as meaningful, I think, that, that, that this computer world, this internet and the connectivity and the intelligence, the information domain that exists, it's already out there. And we talk about information dominance. Uh, we may have lost that one already. Whoever they are, uh, they're going to win that war because that's their turf. So finally, uh, just the pogoism, we've met the enemy and they're us. This is actually a, a, a future conflict of our own design. Uh, J.D. Bernal talked about this. I, I use, actually, if I back up one, every time I see popular or scientific magazines or literature like this, <laughs> to me this is, remember the canaries in the mines that alerted miners when there were uh, unseen but dangerous lethal levels of gases present when the canaries stopped chirping? Well, these are the canaries of the mind. Uh, and they're chirping really loud, trying to tell us that there is an unseen but present danger. Uh, and, and we need to get off the sidelines and start thinking about it. And I'm a former dean of engineering and a technologist, and I should be, I don't know, should I be cheering for the home team, the robots, or? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but these are the canaries in the mind. Every time you see an article like this, let the bell go off. Rem remind you, this is, this is not science fiction. This is real stuff. And then, uh, Finally, I'd like to end with a quote from J.D. Bernal uh, from 1929. I'll paraphrase it. <coughs> he said that scientific capability was approaching the point that we would no longer be uh, guided by environmental constraints and that we would have the capability of improving upon ourselves, but that soon after that, we would have the opportunity with science and technology uh, not to simply work with the biological forms bequeathed to us by evolution, but we would be able to have a destiny of our own design. And, and he further pointed out that when that moment occurs, it will be at least as important as the moment in which biological life first appeared on the earth. And all of the indications, all of the indications when we look at these exponentials are that that moment that transcendent moment is going to happen in your all's lifetime. I mean, I look at my generation and think, wow, we're the lucky ones, we get to die. Um, but that, that transcendent moment that J.D. Bernal talks about, that destiny of our own design, that's coming within the next 50 years, and if I'm wrong, the next 100 years. But absolutely, the, the, the signposts are there. The goldfish bowl is filling up with marbles. We haven't noticed it in many of these technologies yet, but it's but it's well along that curve. Uh, and we're seeing the convergence of technologies and things happening in the laboratories. And it's beginning to show up as the canaries in popular literature, a very different kind of ethic. So once again, I want to apologize. This is not the wrap it up, make it all make sense, uh, bring it all to a nice tightly wrapped package kind of talk. This is more the other one of over the horizon that, that at some times within your day to day, and I'm, and I'm not crazy, uh, <laughs> well, not all the time, and, uh, but I am a technologist and I see this happening in lots of laboratories and lots of fields of science and engineering, uh, and we get so consumed with the myopia of our day-to-day -day lives that it's pretty hard to step back and look at what's going to happen 25, 30, 50 years from now, uh, but when you do, I get a very scary picture. Uh, and I think it has enormous calls for, for ethical thinking, uh, helping to navigate a future that's coming, whether we like it or not. And it affects war fighting, it affects society as a whole, it changes the whole dynamic even of who our adversaries really are. So once again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and scare you, and I hope you have a great weekend. <laughs> thank you.